Hi, this is your host, Bhartia, and we are back with our popular prediction series. And we have with us once again, Yulin Fisher, CEO and part of any nines. Yulin, it's great to have you back on our yearly series. Great to be back. Thank you for having me. Uh, before, of course, I ask you to pick your crystal ball and tell us a prediction. Quickly remind our viewers, what is any nines all about? Well, any nines is a cloud automation company that has a strong focus on data service automation for both Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes. Excellent, thank you. Now it's time for you to pick up your crystal ball and share four or five predictions that you have for us. Yeah, well, first of all, I see a, a trend in the Kubernetes community to um, you know, move up the stack. So with Kubernetes clusters being used to, let's say, do lift and shift, um, you know, removing uh, dependencies to virtual machines and moving workloads to containers, now there's a trend to build application platforms. And uh, with that, we're coming closer to you know, competing with Cloud Foundry in that sense. So I would say the next few years, we'll see that competition grow. And uh, you know, there are a, a few interesting challenges that need to be solved along the way. And I'd say addressing them is, is some of the trends we will see in the next, in the next year or two. If you haven't heard that AI is a current trend, I'm pretty sure, right? Wherever you go, there's AI. Um, AI and Kubernetes also are about to form a relationship. So Kubernetes also expands into the AI sector. So we will see the adoption of AI tooling uh, and somehow bringing together AI and Kubernetes quite a lot. Because if you think about having, let's say, a data center with uh, a lot of computers and a lot of GPUs, you have the same problem with computers that don't have GPUs, like how do you bring and distribute workloads dynamically and in a, in a formalized way and in a standardized way to those GPUs in the first place? So I think Kubernetes will have a share in that too. So third, the question is, what is the dynamic between Kubernetes and uh, Cloud Foundry going to be? I personally believe Corifi will mature more, but I, I still believe that the classic Cloud Foundry stack will have its stable place for the upcoming year and for the years after that as well. Even that Kubernetes you know, moves up the app into application developer platforms, it will take a while for the community to solve the problems Cloud Foundry solves, especially working at scale. Because in the Kubernetes ecosystem, that involves dealing with fl fleets of Kubernetes clusters. I think Clutch is making a contribution to that, but it'll take more than that to uh, you know, enable Kubernetes to replace large Cloud Foundry environments. Or I would say more probable, more probable, there will be toolings that allow you to create application developer platforms with a slightly different you know, um, flavor that are suitable for creating greenfield platforms. Um, that, that is something that will be you know, the case in the, in the next one or two years. So when it comes to edge computing, it's not, it's not a, a, a scenario that we look at very, very often, but we see customers also expanding their Kubernetes workloads into, let's say, small, small regions. Industry could be, let's say, um, what used to be a physical rack in a factory now has Kubernetes running on top of it. And then the question is, how do you combine the flexibility that is enabled by Kubernetes with some of the ideas that, for example, Central IT had in running those larger scale platforms? So in, in basically what you have to test is how, man, how many of or which of the operational best practices are applicable to edge scenarios as well. This includes, for example, do you want to have self-contained contain, uh, clusters where data services run next to applications? Or if, let's say, even a small region, we call them micro regions, let's say a, a rack of computers, are they already big enough to, let's say, have a separation of data so services from application clusters, and then you could also apply, you know, those strategies, including technology such as Clutch, to edge um, scenarios as well. So exploring that will be very interesting, and I would predict that a lot of micro regions are big enough to make sense of apply best practices that come from central IT platforms will now be applicable to small micro regions as well. Not in every case 
but I, I would say it's worth having a look at it. So an interesting trend, and we've been active in the data on Kubernetes uh, community for years, is also how is the how is Kubernetes making progress as a foundation for data service automation? So in my opinion, Kubernetes as an automation technology is absolutely capable of writing operators that are production grade. I don't see a reason why you shouldn't use Kubernetes for that matter. In particular, if we introduce more data service, we will do that on the basis of Kubernetes. Instead of using Bosch BOSH, um, because it's, and that the first reason is not a technology one, it's, uh, the, it's just, it's easier to get um, DevOps and engineers who know Kubernetes than ha finding people that want to learn BOSH, which, which is a pity to some degree, but it's, I mean, the reality of the job market. And that being said, the question is, what is the one of the biggest challenges in data on Kubernetes at the moment? And it's, um, I, I would say, the availability of a production grade open source operators. I mean, there are plenty of operators, but, but a lot of organizations cannot use them in production because they are not enterprise grade. I mean, we've been through data service automation for a decade, starting in, in, in 2014 based on declarative automation. It takes a long time to build an automation of a data service complicated as Postgres and make it production grade. So we have environments where there's a, a single service like Postgres is being used, I don't know, a thousand or 2000 times. That means that the automation needs to be very predictable. And even throughout, you know, infrastructure problems, uh, upgrades in, in all those life cycle, you know, events that will occur as databases tend to live very long. So you need to maintain a cluster, a Kubernetes cluster, perfectly. And at the same time, you need to run these operators perfectly. That requires a certain understanding of the underlying database as well. And so I think it's more a question of the Kubernetes system, uh, the Kubernetes ecosystem started late to automating databases in a declarative way compared to, for example, what we did in the Cloud Foundry ecosystem. So it's more maturity of the people writing operators than it is about the, uh, the ability of Kubernetes uh, as a suitable technology, which it definitely is. Open source, in my opinion, as a concept, has been harmed in the last few years significantly. The emergence of licenses such as the SSPL with, you know, valid intentions has definitely created um, controversial discussions of open source as something to rely on, especially after enterprises slowly got into the adoption of open source, starting from a very skeptical position and then being taught that this skepticism was actually absolutely justified. So I think if you commit something in, you know, in an open source way, you need to get behind it with your full weight. You need to stand by it and you, you need to give something because you believe that, that donating that, that particular thing, that costs money. I mean, Clutch itself cost, is worth, I, I always say, many helicopters. You know, it, it's, it's a multi-million investment and you're just giving away something that could have been your intellectual property. And there are, there are strings and risks attached to open sourcing, uh, open sourcing a technology. But if you want to have a marketing effect from open source, then you also need to live with those risks. And just to pull back later and, you know, close source anything. And, and you know, if you think about the t time dynamics of the SSPL changes, they often happened under very short notice. So it's, I don't think you're, you're, you're doing open source a favor by doing things like that. And I, I believe that it was now time for any nines to say, well, who are we to judge open source if we don't open source anything? So we, we basically stepped up and said, now we are also taking a risk with open sourcing clutch, but we believe now it's the time for people to say, we believe in open source, here's a product, use it, do what you do whatever the license allows you with it. And you know, we, we want open source 
to succeed. Julian, thank you so much for sharing these predictions. And of course, I'll get you again next year to see first of all how many of these predictions turn out to be true and get the next set of predictions. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'd, I'd be joyful to, it would be joyful to talk again.